Hello, family, and welcome back to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty Guadagno, and today I'm joined by Christina. And Christina is a spiritual experiencer. She's a podcast host and a Course in Miracles teacher. And we connected a couple of months ago. I was on, a, I was a guest on Christina's podcast, and I really wanted to repay the energy because we had such a great exchange, and it felt so connected and we had so many synchronicities with each other. So I'm really excited to introduce you to our community at IONS and I'm going to toss it right over to you to start sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I, I loved our episode and again, I agree. There were so many synchronicities and that's actually what I'm going to talk about today as well. On my podcast, you shared your experience with your overdose. So today I'll talk about mine because <laughs> that was my, I've had many spiritual experiences, um, but this one I think was the most pivotal for me. So um, not really sure where to start because my life was um, I was, I was an addict pretty much. So when I was five, I started an addiction with an eating disorder. Um, I quickly made up a story that I was not worth anything unless I was skinny and pretty. And so I, I started to numb out. Um, I really thought that my focus was just on, like, I just want to be skinny or I just want to be pretty, but uh, what I realized much later on was that there was, I was so sensitive and there were already at five years old, so many reasons that I didn't want to be here and that I wanted to escape. And so fast forward, um, the eating disorder was with me for pretty much my whole life until I was 28. I went to treatment while I was in treatment. They told me that I probably shouldn't drink for a year <laughs> when I left. Uh, they told me that I had other addictions as well. And uh, I didn't, I didn't listen. So I left <laughs> treatment for my eating disorder in April, April 1st of 2008. Actually, I asked if I could stay another day because I was like, I don't want to leave on April 1st. <laughs> I want this recovery to stick. Uh, it didn't, I relapsed, but then I did recover. So, um, <laughs> so I didn't stop drinking then, I didn't stop using drugs, but because they had said something, it had planted a seed. So the next five years from 2008, well, we'll talk about the next four years, from 2008 to 2012, uh, I kind of lived in in a, a different level of hell. So I had recovered from my eating disorder, but I was drinking and using drugs and very, very heavily into the party scene. So I had not had much experience with AA at that time, but uh, the expression, you know, a head full of AA and a belly full of beer was kind of what I would equate that time period to. Like, I knew that I shouldn't. Um, I knew that I had a problem. I knew that uh, my life wasn't manageable, but I didn't care um, or pay attention or nor did I think that I had any hope for myself. <laughs> so kind of like, I didn't believe that I could laugh sober. I didn't believe that I could have a good time. Um, so by 2012, I, I'm flailing. Um, this is March of 2012. I had two boyfriends. Uh, <laughs> I had, I was a wreck. And what happened that day was I, had gotten in a fight uh, with one of my boyfriends. And I was so anxious that I actually had been at the time taking um, Klonopin to help me sleep. And I was taking like a half of a one milligram pill. And my other boyfriend had left me a huge bag of two milligram pills. So normally I wouldn't take them unless I was going to sleep, but I had such extreme anxiety from this fight that I had with the other boyfriend. And I was just a wreck that I decided I was going to take two of the two milligrams and drink a bottle of wine and smoke a bunch of weed. And because of that, I had actually blacked out. And so I wasn't intentionally like in a conscious state 
um, when I decided that I was going to try to take my life, I was actually blacked out. And the only reason that I know that I took all those pills is because I started texting people that um, I'm done. I'm going to end my life. You can look for my soul as the sun sets tonight. Like, I don't know, really crazy, random things. And uh, the next thing I know, I actually came to in a psych ward. So I didn't actually die. I took four bottles of narcotics and I didn't die. I just lost a couple of days. And I came to in a psych ward where there was a woman who was yelling about how she just peed her pants. And another woman was like expressing what I was feeling. So she was like, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And that's exactly what I was feeling. And I was about to join her, but they ended up putting her in a separate room and trying to sedate her. So I quickly went into if I behave that way, I'm never going to get out of this psych ward. So I quickly fell into line. I was cooperative. I did whatever they said, and I was released. So uh, the day I took the pills, the four bottles of pills was a Sunday, and it was Wednesday morning that I came to and was released from a psych ward. So I haven't had my spiritual experience yet because I was so deeply in addiction that I came home and I got loaded for two more days. Um, that was, I didn't even think that what I did warranted any kind of change in behavior. I just blacked out, tried to kill myself, came to, came home and went right back to it. And I had a friend who flew out from Texas and she was a channel and this was now Friday morning. So I was released from treatment or from the psych ward <laughs> on Wednesday. And Friday morning, I was sitting on my living room floor with my friend. And I honestly, there was no structure. It wasn't like we're going to go into a channeling session. It's just kind of naturally happened where we both closed our eyes. And there was a lot of talking that was going on, but I don't remember what was being said. All I remember is that all of a sudden appeared three images, Jesus, Buddha, and Mary, and they were in a trinity. And in that moment, I just knew something. I really had no conscious awareness of what I was feeling, but I knew something. And I, in hindsight, I would say maybe I knew I was held or that I was cared for or that I had help. I don't know, because I really was just in the experience of these things. So I, I saw them. And as soon as I came out, I looked at my friend. And for the first time ever, I said out loud, I don't think I should drink. I have a problem. And I think I might be an alcoholic. And at that point, I had put 90 days together. Um, so I stopped drinking for 90 days. I stopped taking all medications that I <laughs> went and manipulated my psychiatrist to give me so that I could continue to use. And I just stopped everything cold turkey. And during these next three months, Christ consciousness, Jesus, Buddha, Mary, they were just so apparent in my life. Uh, but I hadn't had a psychic change yet. And so I remember not going to AA, uh, doing all these other things and counting the days I was counting, you know, I was white knuckling. I was not happy. I was not, <laughs> well, uh, I was just dry and I was very, very anxious and it, it really sucked. Uh, so I did put 90 days together. And I think on the 91st or 92nd day, I went out and I went out for another year. Uh, but because I had overdosed in that time, I would talk about it in the spiritual communities I had already created. And so that led me to finding A Course in Miracles. And I started going to A Course in Miracles groups. I started studying with them. And honestly, I really can't say that I retained much, right? I was out, I was drinking, I was, you know, still in all my behaviors, but it just felt true. 
like it just felt true. And prior to all of this, I had really no connection to spirituality. Um, it, I was not atheist. I, I just literally had no thought of God or the universe or, or prayer or anything like that. I did get meditation from going to treatment for the eating disorder, but I had, I had nothing. And so throughout these five years, I'm studying the course I'm, or throughout this year, cause this was 2012. Um, now I know, I know I'm an alcoholic and I'm drinking anyways, and I'm using drugs. And I was just suffering more than I had ever suffered in my entire life. And so I started praying and I didn't know what to expect. I just, because of my experience with the course, I just started asking God to disrupt my life enough to where I would stop these patterns. And in my mind, that was getting in a car accident or, you know, getting hurt so that I could be in bed with a bunch of pills instead of going to happy hour and then being out for three days. So, um, I just kept asking, I just kept asking. And one morning I realized that I hadn't gotten my period. I found out that I was pregnant and in that I did not know if it was guy A or guy B. And my first thought, honestly, was, you know, I'm on my hands and literally I had my bathroom moment, right? I'm in the bathroom. I find out I'm pregnant. Uh, I'm on my hands and knees on the bathroom floor crying. My first thought is I'm going to have a home birth. <laughs> this is my third kid. I'm going to have a home birth. And my second thought was I'm going to go to AA and I'm going to do the work. And the course, Jesus, I feel like it all led me to, to that moment of actual surrender and seeing, I had a vision that I was going to have 10 kids with 10 different dads. And I just, all of that was given to me by spirit so that I could surrender and say, I'm going to go to AA and I'm going to do the work. And so I did, I was held by the course community, which most of them were sober. <laughs> I would say 95% of the people in that course community were sober. Um, I was held by the course community. I was held by 12 step. I was held by other communities. And the truth is it wasn't until a year later when I was speaking at a meeting on my one year AA birthday that I realized that God answered my prayer and he didn't hurt me. He gave me a baby. He gave me a life. Another person that I can guide in this life. And when I realized that, I just, there was no doubt that, I mean, I do doubt, like <laughs> I forget <laughs> and I have to get back on course. But in that moment, the feeling of trusting the care of God for me, like I believed it, but I thought it applied to everyone else and not me. So in that moment, I saw, wow, like God cares about me. And I think that was really the turning point of how much I I could trust <laughs> that, that I'm taken care of and that I'm held. And, you know, all these pieces played a part. There's so much more to my story. Um, I have to shorten it a lot because <laughs> that was 10 years ago. And so um, I'll just stop there for, yeah, for Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing. Thanks for getting honest and raw and vulnerable and sharing all of all of those pieces of yourself. And I love the the ability to be able to see from kind of that eagle perspective, like, oh, wow, this course of events happened to put mm -hmm. me onto a different path. And I think that that's what spiritual awareness is all about, is really about coming to that understanding that everything is happening for our highest good, good, bad, and indifferent. All of those things are leading us towards a path. So, okay, you talked about being a parent. I love asking people this question. What is it like being a parent 
living in spiritual awareness? Do you find yourself consciously parenting? Um, does that all go out the window? Does all of your spirituality go out the window when you're dealing with your kids? Or what's that process like? Yeah, um, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> So uh, a little while ago, I actually uh, discovered a book called Conscious Parenting. And so with the course, um, having been in my life, having had my kids prior to getting so, I mean, I had one kid prior to going to treatment, two kids prior to getting sober, I've had quite the experience <laughs> with these kids. And um, I would say it's a mix of both. So most of the time, I am really looking for when I'm triggered that reflection of, okay, what, what am I thinking? How can I extend love? Um, and, you know, really doing the work. And there are times where I am, and, and it's mostly about my youngest son and his lack of organization in his room. <laughs> So I know I'm very clear on what, you know, the things that will set me off are, but, um, I, I have, I've raged and, you know, on the other side of it, I used to beat myself up. Sometimes I, I still do. There's not a time where it doesn't happen that I am just like, oh, that happened. And, you know, now I can forgive myself that that's never the case. There's always like some emotional hangover, but, um, you know, what helps me in those times is that we're all playing a role for each other. They picked me, I picked them. And it's an opportunity for me to apply the course principles to myself and to teach them how to repair, how to choose again. And it's not fun, but you know, I love that you asked this question because I think that a lot of people have a view that people, parents who are in a spiritual journey are perfect. And I make it a point to share how unperfect I am in my parenting, because I will say that the honest truth is that the majority of the time, I think I'm a bad mom. And that's something I get to work through as well. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty. I, you know, I'm always, a. Uh... I'm always so interested to hear about what conscious parenting is like for people on the spiritual path, just because mm -hmm. I have my own inner child to parent. And so sometimes I take little tips from what I hear from parents and I'm like, oh, I could apply that in my relationship with my own inner child. Um, and yeah. plus, I just, I think that it's amazing the shift that's happening in consciousness that there are a wave of parents right now who are conscious, conscious and trying to you know, like teach their children these values at a, at an early age, like who says it'll take nobody, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we don't know what's to come, but I, I want to maybe steer the conversation in this direction now. So you're of course in miracles teacher, but there might mm -hmm. be some people out there that are listening that have no idea what we're talking about when we say a course in miracles. So yeah. could you explain a little bit about what that is and yeah, your interpretation of the work? Yeah, so I love talking about the course. Um, so the course is a, it's mind training, really, is what it is. But it is a book that was a channeled work. So a woman named Helen channeled Jesus. And it says right in the beginning that, you know, it's a course in miracles. It's a required course. And the only thing that's left to, you know, is your choice to take it. And what it talks about is pretty much like I'm trying to figure out how to summarize this in like the short time that we have. Uh, but really for me, it just, it's truth. That's what it feels like to me. It's truth. When I opened the book, honestly, I, I couldn't tell you what what any of it meant. Like it was really hard to understand, but I could feel the truth. I could feel Jesus in it. I really believe that Jesus led me to, to this course. And so there's pieces to it. There's a text, there's a workbook, um, there's a psychotherapy section, and pretty much it's, it's telling us how we had a thought or God had a thought 
And that thought was, what if I'm separate from God? And so inside of that thought, all of this happened. And that's the only really error we've ever had or made or created was that the belief that we're separate from God. And so the entire book, the workbook, which is a lesson for every single day of the year, everything in this book is helping you to undo the beliefs that are creating these nightmares that we're having. So it talks about the world being an illusion or a dream. And so it's it's an undoing of what we believe so that we can truly be in our power power, um, with a huge emphasis. And this is probably why I was so attracted to it because I do a lot of work around connection and authentic relating. And so it's, it's unlike anything that I've really been exposed to in that it really focuses on the work being done with other people. So one of the main concepts is that we don't get to heaven by ourselves alone, that we bring our brothers with us. And so there's a lot of focus on forgiveness, forgiveness of others, seeing others as the son of God. And that is truly how salvation of the world happens. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, Yes. I'm also a student and a teacher of A Course in Miracles. And if anybody's unfamiliar, it looks like this, just a little bit of light reading. Just kidding. This is like 1800 (laughs) pages long. Um, And Yeah, I really liked everything that you had to say. And, you know, for me, I found a beautiful Course in Miracles community. And like you just shared, you also had a community to help you with this. I think Mm -hmm. one of the really amazing things about this text is that the woman who channeled it was a militant uh, atheist. And you can just tell that these are not human words inside of this book. And for me, it's been definitely one of the main leading guiding stars in my spiritual integration journey. After my spiritual experience, this was the book that Mm -hmm. rang most true to me, that uh, kind of aligned with my spiritual experience. That, and for me also, uh, the scripture and the Baha'i faith, those are the two things Mm -hmm. that really resonated the most for me. So thank you for mentioning it because it's a great tool. I also suggest that if anybody's interested in getting involved in this, there's a great author. His name is Alan Cohen, and he wrote a book called A Course in Miracles Made Easy. And Mm -hmm. it's a great introduction to this gigantic, (laughs) this gigantic spiritual work right here. So I always suggest reading books about the course before getting into the course. That's what I did. And it really helped. Yeah. Um, There's also, uh, because it is really for me, like I felt it to be true, but I could not at first to comprehend, you know, some of the, the ways things were being said. Jesus also talks in parables. So, uh, you know, that's also part of it. But there's so many podcasts. There's, I just finished an interview on my podcast about A Course in Miracles. We've talked about it. There's so many resources out there to assist you in your journey with A Course in Miracles because so many teachers want to spread it that we've, we're making it easy for people. So that book that you mentioned, amazing. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so many resources. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. Gabrielle Bernstein was the first author that I found that introduced me to the course. And in fact, I thought that she wrote it because I just, I had only heard about it in her books. And I kept looking at the library for A Course in Miracles by Gabrielle Bernstein. And of course it wasn't there because she didn't write it. Um, So yeah. Yeah. But thank you for bringing it up. I think that it's a great spiritual tool. And um Yeah, while we have some more time, I want to see if maybe obviously you told us your experience from 10 years ago, finding your way onto the spiritual path. Are there any other stories that you'd like to share about spiritual experiences in that time? Oh, my goodness. Um, Yeah, I probably could. (laughs) Like, I need to, you know, jog my memory a little bit. Um, And I guess I'll just start, you know, by talking about how in, in these, you know, now it's been 12 years because I found the court course in March of 2012. And then I got sober in December of 2013. And there's been so many little pieces of, of evidence that, um, along the way, you know, that, that I can put in my little bucket of like, 
yes, like this is the truth. This is real. I'm on the right path. You know, Jesus is always with me. So, uh, you know, I was a wreck and uh, my first or my first, my baby that uh, when I found out I was pregnant with him, I um, got sober. Uh, so the, the, the father turned out to be a one night stand <laughs> and, uh, I didn't know him and I wanted to breastfeed. And so, um, he was scared that I wasn't going to allow 50, 50 custody and he took me to court. So I'm barely a year sober. I'm going through this court custody case. Like I, my lawyer the day before, well, weeks leading up the, to the trial, he was not, he was MIA missing in action. And so the day before he finally calls me and I spent my time, uh, writing a request for a continuance. And also those three days leading up to it, all I did was pray. All I did was pray. I did not study law. I did not study what I was going to say in court. I, nothing, I just prayed. And so we're, we're in the trial and I'm asking the judge for a continuance and she decides that she's going to help us settle this. So his lawyer was removed from the equation and she talked directly to us, which was so beautiful without that extra added like fight in there. So then he's, you know, requesting some things and I start spitting out law. I've never studied law. <laughs> This was my third kid, so I had a little bit of familiarity, but I cited the law on child support. I have no idea where that came from. And the judge looked at me and she said, she's right. And so that ended up going in my favor, which I was totally afraid that it wouldn't. But I'm, I mean, when I'm, I'm hearing myself say, you know, the laws about child support in Arizona, and I'm, I'm like, almost like, who is this speaking through me? <laughs> like, like what? <laughs> and uh, so that was one of the first, um, you know, that was a year after I was sober that that, that whole thing happened. Um, just recently, um, this was the most recent one, I went to the big island of Hawaii and we stayed in Kona one night um, around the Captain Cook area. And for anyone who's not familiar, there's there was so much devastation there. And in the same night, which I see a lot of things, um, I feel a lot of things, but um, I'm usually not scared. And there was there was a hint of fear um, there. And so I'm I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm praying. And, uh, you know, I hear um, the goddess of volcanoes, Pele, coming to to reassure me that um, that I was safe and also to tell me that, you know, I am supposed to channel her. <laughs> I'm like, OK, so the reason I share, you know, the first and the last is because that is the range of so many things in my life that have happened since then. And I'm sure if I were to look hard enough, I would find spiritual experiences prior to when I saw Jesus, Buddha and Mary. But um, that was really, you know, those are the the big ones that kind of tail end the beginning and the present, not the end, but, <laughs> and so there's tons of them in between. And uh, yeah, I just, don't have any other ones on the top. No, no, that, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. It's amazing, amazing, amazing how we can kind of tap into this universal wisdom and yeah. allow it to flow through us without our permission, just yeah. like beautiful miracles and synchronicities just take place in our life. And yeah. I love the story that you shared. Thank you so much. I want to thank you for taking time out to come and share with our community today. And I just, I want to see if there's anything else that you'd like to share to feel more complete about our time together. Yeah. You know, I just want to say like in regards to the spiritual experiences and uh, the way you talked about like that universal knowledge or consciousness, you know, flowing through us, I and I, I'd be curious to hear your take on this as well. But what I what I notice for me and others that I've worked with is that 
getting sober allows so much more to flow through us. So like, if you do take the spiritual experiences I had, you know, 10, 12 years ago and, and the ones I'm having now, like they've evolved in, in the only way that I can really explain it is that after not drinking or using or being in addiction for 10 years from drugs and alcohol, 15 years from my eating disorder is that the more we, we clear ourselves out, we do become those clear channels for that universal consciousness for the divine. And, you know, I know this is a podcast about spiritual experiences and, uh, you know, things of that sort, but I also want to just say that as far as recovery and addiction and sobriety, um, as long as you're breathing, there's always hope. Like I really not just believe it, but I know that to be true. And so for anyone who might be struggling, if you ever feel like reaching out, I'm always available to lend a helping hand to another addict. That is so beautiful. Yes. Thank you for sharing that connection. I really feel like is the antidote to addiction. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't like to claim truth for everybody because everybody's different. Like for me, it's been letting go of drugs, alcohol, caffeine, sugar, becoming a vegan, being gluten free, drinking only water. Like, I, you know, I'm extreme. I was extreme in addiction. I'm extreme in recovery, too. So, you know, for me, those are the things that work for me. But I, but I know people who eat McDonald's every day and they're clear channels for spirit. And like in my right. head, I'm like, how could that possibly be? but right. it's because you know we're all on different journeys here and maybe that wasn't part of their lesson but I think for us like that are in recovery letting go is definitely part of our human experience how to let go of things that no longer serve and I really appreciate your openness about yeah the at the aspects of your life where you've been in recovery because I think they impact a lot of people and it's important for us to recover loudly so that other yeah. people can too yeah, I love that you said that because that was another spiritual experience. I, I am a Reiki healer, but I was getting a Reiki session and this was very early in sobriety. And the Reiki healer said that she saw me speaking and she saw me sharing all the darkness that at that time I was ashamed of. And now I, I'm not ashamed of it. Like I want to share it <laughs> loudly. <laughs> So thank you for yes. giving me a platform to do so. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, me too, me too. And of course, in Miracle says that we live inside of a dream. So why not let it all out? It's just a dream right. anyway, who cares? <laughs> yeah. And it talks about how we we shouldn't have anything to hide. And full transparency is full, perfect communication. So I am transparent. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you again for your willingness to serve our community by sharing a piece of yourself today. All of your links will be in the liner notes of this episode and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure.